Welcome back everyone to Math Explore Infinity. I'm absolutely thrilled to, to have you join me once again for this um, exploration. So today um, we are going to demystify the, the concept of convolution and regularization. And as usual, right, I, I mean, I've got a, a metaphor that will um, set your mathematical imagination ablaze. So um, imagine that um, you have two smartphones, right? Each with a different app. So let's say um, one phone has a camera app and the other has a music app, for instance. Now convolution is like um, taking a picture with one phone, right? And then playing your favorite song with the other phone. But the twist is that, I mean, you don't just, I mean, you don't just um, do it once, right? But you do it um, um, repeatedly. So as you snap more pictures and play more songs, right? Something um, obviously remarkable happens, right? So the, the pictures and the music actually blend together, right? And create a, I mean, a brand new experience. I mean, it's as if the, I mean, the two phones actually um, are working together to create a mesmerizing um, slideshow of memory set to music. So that is exactly um, what convolution is. I mean, the art of combining two different things to create something um, entirely unique. So, um, so we start um, by defining the convolution product of a function f in L1 uh, with a function, say, g in LP. So um, let's take, I mean, our first theorem. So, um, theorem. 4.15 this is young children okay so let f be in l1 so let f be in l1 of rn right and G be an element of LP of Rn, right, with um, P in between 1 and plus infinity. So let me just highlight where P lives. Mm. It's important to note. Okay, good. So then for almost every x in Rn, the function, so um, the function which at y associates f of x minus y times g of y, right, is actually integrable on Rn. And we define we define um, in the convolution product of f and g to be the integral of r n of f of x minus y times g of y. Oops gy. So in addition, in addition, the convolution product of f and g is in Lp of Rn, right? And we even have a bound for the norm, the LP norm of the convolution product. So this is less or equal than the L1 norm of F times the LP norm of, of G. Okay, good. So let's have a look at the proof. So proof. So the first, I mean, we are going to proceed by case distinction. So um, let's see. So the conclusion is 
I mean, for the KSP equal infinity, I mean, everything is rather clear and easy to prove. So the conclusion is um, it's obvious. For P equals plus infinity. So we only consider two cases here. So we only consider um, only consider two cases, as I said. So the first case would be the number one would be the case um, P equals one, and the second case would be the case P. Um, sorry, between one and infinity. Okay, good. So we start with the first case. So case one. So this is the case P equals one. So consider. So consider the function f of x. And the function defined by the f of x y equals to f of x minus y times d of y right so for for almost every y in, in rn like you have you have the integral of rn oops of the absolute value of f of x y dx right is actually less or equal <coughs> than the absolute value of d of y d of y times the integral over rn of the absolute value of f of x minus y dx I mean you can pull absolute value of d of y because you are integrating over in, over x only in, in rn so this is actually less or equal than I mean, the absolute value of g of y times the L1 norm of, of f. Of course, this is actually finite. So moreover, moreover, the integral over Rn of dy of the integral of the absolute value of f of x y dx right which is equal to the integral over rn of the absolute value of of dy of d of y dy um let me drag it let me squeeze it So this is equal to um, integral over Rn of um, the absolute value of, oops, let me just check something, good. The absolute value of um, f of x minus y dx. Okay, so this is exactly equals to, so this is the L1 norm of g, right, times the L1 norm of, of f, right? I mean, this is exactly um, the L1 norm of the L1 norm of, of f, right? I mean, by just write it by um, change of variable. Good. So, and this is actually finite. So, we deduce from, so we deduce from. To Nelly's theorem, I think there was um, theorem um, 4.4 when we talk about um, major theory and integration. So I strongly invite you to check it out. So we use from to Nelly's theorem. So this is. 4.4 
deduce that f is actually um, integrable over the Cartesian product r n cos r n. So now applying um, Fubini's theorem. So applying Fubini's theorem. This is um, this was theorem. Um, 4.5 and just highlight those in 4.5. We have here play Fibini's theorem. Right, so we see that we see that um, the integral over Rn of the absolute value of f of x y dy oops is finite right for almost every x in Rn right so this means that this map with um, f of x oops times d of y is integrable for almost every x in, in Rn. So this was one of the things that we had to show. So furthermore, furthermore, now we are trying to prove the bound of the LP norm, the LP norm of the um, convolution product. Furthermore, we have the integral of Rn dx right the integral of r and of the absolute value of f of x y dy so this is again i mean this is um still by fubini's theorem but we can interchange the we can actually interchange the i mean the order of integration so this would be integral of r n of the absolute value of f of x y dx right so um, so this is exactly I mean this would be um, so let me just write it this would be exactly the L1 norm of f right times of g times the L1 norm of of f and observe that um, this here is actually, um, I mean, still by Fibini, this is the integral of uh, the Cartesian product, right, of the absolute value of f of x, y, dx, dy. So, but again, I mean, this quantity is actually um, greater or equal than the absolute value of, of um, I think I don't, we don't even need it. So. Okay, so this means that the L1 norm of the convolution product, right, which is nothing less as being the integral of, uh, I mean, over the Cartesian product of the absolute value of f of x, y, dx, dy. So the L1 norm of that is equal to the L1 norm of g times the L1 norm of, of f. So observe that for the case p equal one, we even have an, I mean, so we even have an equality. Okay, good. So this was the case p equals one. So now um, let's move to the case where p is strictly between one and plus infinity. Case number two, oops. This is for P slightly between one and plus infinity. So um by case one, right? So by the case P equals one, we know that um for almost every fix 
x in Rn. You know that the function, um, you just write the function, which at y associate um, the absolute value of f of x minus y times the absolute value of g of y to the power p, like this integrable. On Rn, right? This is actually um, just right y. So this is because so this is because um, as g is actually in Lp, right? I mean, absolute value of of g to the power p is an element of L1. Okay, so this means that the absolute value of f of x, I mean, of this function, right, I mean, the dot stands for, I mean, the variable, right, so, um, times the absolute value of g, right, is actually an element of lp, lpy of rn, right, so, in fact, um, well, I mean, observe that, I mean, the integral over Rn, right, of the absolute value of f of x minus y. As, I mean, as I said, the dot is just a placeholder, right, for the corresponding variable. So this is the, the integral of Rn of the absolute value of f of x minus y to the power 1 over p um, times the absolute value of d of y, right, everything to the power p, so this is absolute value to the power p, dy is actually, it's actually finite, right, because, I mean, this integral of absolute value of f of x minus y, or the absolute value of d of y, to the power p, dy, it's finite. Okay, so, so we have um, this function that is in LPY of Rn, right? Moreover, oh, since absolute value of f of x, I mean, evaluated at the translated point, to the power 1 over p prime is actually in, in LP prime y of Rn. Right, I mean, remember that f is actually in L1, so. Um, the, I mean, absolute value of f of x evaluated, of f evaluated at the translated point x minus, I mean, minus dot, right, to the power 1 over p prime is an element of l p prime um, of rn. So, we deduce from all the inequality Right, I mean, reduce inequality applied to, and you just recall, applied to um, this function, of course, right? Over 1 over p prime, which is an element of L p prime y, right? And the function um, absolute value of f of x minus dot, right? To the power one over p, yeah, and just the value of g, which is an element of lp, y of of rn. So we deduce from Hölder's inequality, apply to those functions. Um, again, p prime is um, is the conjugate exponent of p, so. So we deduce from Hölder's inequality that um, we deduce that the product is actually in L1. So this is this minus the power one over p prime times the absolute value of f of x minus dot to the power one over p absolute value of oops this dot right. This is actually in L1. 
of our n, right? So this means that the actual value of f of x minus dot right times that this is actually in L1 y of of Rn, right? Because I mean um remember that one over p plus one over p prime equals one. Okay, so this means that for almost every x in Rn, right, the map which at y associate f of x minus y times g of y, right, is, is integrable. And this is, I mean, what we will have to show, right, for the second part. Now we move to um, to the bound. So moreover, um, the integral of Rn of the absolute value of f of x minus y, absolute value of g of y, dy, right, is actually um, less or equal than the norm of f to the power 1 over p prime, the yeah, p prime norm, of course, times, uh, I write it down here, the norm of f of x minus, I mean, the function f evaluated at the translated point is to the power 1 over p times g, the LP norm of this. I mean, this is um, basically um, hold this inequality, right? So, so this is actually um, less or equal than the other one norm of f, right? But this is actually to the power one over p prime, right? Times. Now we are going to write the full expression of this LP norm. So this is f of x minus y, the absolute value. Right, times g of y in absolute value, but this time to the power p. So let me just um, shift it a bit to the left. So dy, everything raised to the power 1 over p. So this is my definition of, of the norm. Now, um, observe that this quantity here is actually. Um, this is greater or equal than the absolute value of the convolution product. So this means that um, the absolute value, let me just write it here, the absolute value of the convolution product of f and g, right, to the power p, is actually less or equal than the norm of f, the L1 norm of f, right, to the power p over p prime, right, times the integral over Rn, um, the absolute value of f of x minus y, absolute value of g of y to the power p, dy. Okay, so, um, well, um, this is actually less or equal than um, the norm of f1 to the power p over p prime. This is clear, right? Times here, observe that I can rewrite this expression as um, the absolute value of f, right? The convolution product between the absolute value of f and the absolute value of g to the power p. So this applies to x, of course. Now um, we can conclude by right, using. So we conclude um, we conclude this is by case one once again.
So we conclude by case one that the convolution product of f and j is of just in LP of Rn, right? Means we just need to take the integral I mean, on both sides of the inequality. And then you see that the convolution product is, is actually in LP and the LP norm of of f convoluted with g, right? It's actually less or equal than the L1 norm of f to the power p over p prime um, times just right directly the result times the norm of f, the L1 norm of f times the, the L1 norm of of g to the power p, right? So in fact, um, let me use another color. Um, observe that I mean this quantity here is actually in L1 y of Rn, right? So and by case one, we know that um, I mean this norm is exactly I mean the norm of absolute value of f convoluted with the value of j to the power p, 1 is exactly equal to the other one norm of f times the other one norm of, of j to the power p. So good. So um, again, here observe that this norm here is nothing less than the norm of g, right, to the, I mean the LP norm of g to the, to the power p. So this means that the LP norm of the convolution product of f and g is less or equal than the norm of f, the L1 norm of f times the LP norm of g. Okay, good. So this actually ends the proof of the Young theorem and now we proceed um, with some notation first. So notation. So given a function um, CF in Rn, right? So we set. We said um, we call it f hat, right? Set f hat of x to be f of minus x. So, proposition um, I think proposition 4.6. Think so. So, let f be in L1 of Rn, right? G in LP of Rn and H in LP prime of, of Rn. So again, let me just highlight the power, I mean, where those functions live. So then, we have the integral of Rn of the convolution product of f with g times h of x dx, right? This is nothing else than the integral of Rn of g of x times the convolution product of f hat with h dx. Okay, so proof. So, um, we, I mean, let's, I mean, let's 
let's actually show first that um, so let's show first that I mean the integral is well defined right and the integral is well defined very fast thing to do okay for that um, put f of x y to be um, f of x minus y times d of y times h of x now since d is in lp right and f is in l1 it follows from young theorem that it follows from I think it was theorem 4.15 sorry this is young theorem so it follows from theorem 4.15 that the map which at h no which at y um, associate f of x minus y times d of y is integrable for almost every x for almost every x in rn right so this means um, that if this function right is in lp in l1 y of of rn so moreover moreover you have um, I mean the integral of a uh, r n dx the integral of a uh, r n of the absolute value of f of x y dy so this is I write it down here this is exactly the integral of r n of h of x the absolute value of course um, dx the integral over no, let me not put dx there the integral of r n of the absolute value of f of x minus y absolute value of d of y dy dx so um now observe that this h is actually in lp prime right and then we know that the convolution product here yeah, is actually in lpx right of i mean let put lpx in seen as a function of x right so this is in lp and this is by um by Young's theorem, right? Or Young's inequality. So we can actually apply um Holder's inequality to see that this is actually less or equal than the LP prime norm of H times the LP norm of the convolution product. So this is follow some inequality okay so and um, of course this is actually um, finite so by um, Tonelli's theorem f is integrable over the Cartesian product Rn cos Rn. So therefore, you have um, the integral of Rn of the convolution product, right? Pi to x times h of x dx so this is 
exactly equals to the integral over rn of dx um, of the integral over rn of f of x, y, dy. So by Fibini, this is, I can change the order of integration. So this is the integral over rn, dy, integral over rn of f of x, y, dx. Let me just recall the argument here. This is Fibini's theorem. Okay, so um, so this is nothing less than the integral of r n g y of the integral of r n. Now you write the full expression of capital F of x y, which was actually f of x minus y times d of y times um, h of x dx. Now um, observe that. This is exactly f hat of y minus x. So this is equal to um, the integral of, a, of a rn of input d of y here, right? Times the integral of, a, of a rn of f hat of y minus x. Right, times h of x dx dy. Right. This expression here is exactly I mean, convolution product of f hat and h, right, applied to y. So this is. Um, Integral of r n of d of y times f at convoluted with h at y dy, and this is um, exactly what you had to show. Okay, good. Um, so far we, I mean. I mean, so far so good. Um, so far we, we have the definition of, um, I mean, standard definition of the support of a function, right? I mean, we know that, um, say, the support of a function f is actually um, the smallest closed set, right, beyond which f vanishes, right, or the biggest open set on which the function um, vanishes. So this is the closure of this set. This is how uh, we define the support, right, of the function f. But um, this notion is not actually um, is not actually adequate, right, when dealing with equivalence classes like LP spaces, for instance. For example, I mean, if I gave you the function f, which is actually um, say. Um, the indicator function of the rational numbers, right? So under the standard definition, we have that the support of of f, right? I mean, let me just write support of chi q. This will be the closure of of q, right? But q is actually dense in R, so this is so the support of chi u will be um, chi q will be will be R, right? But this actually um, this, I mean, does not make sense, right? I tell you why. So this doesn't make sense. Because, I mean, like you, it's actually zero almost everywhere. Right, because remember that, I mean, the, the best measure of the set Q is actually zero. So we need actually, I mean, a new definition. Right, so we, we need a definition that we kind of um, account for 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 I mean for element in, in LP spaces, for instance. So we could say, for instance, that okay, so um, the support of two function, I mean, 
will be equal, right? Or the fair plus null set if both functions are equal, right? Of plus null set, I mean, almost every way. So in the following um, proposition, I mean, we are going to introduce, I mean, the, I would say, the appropriate notion of support of a function. So this is actually proposition 4.7. This is um, let me just recall and definition. Oops. And definition of of the support. Okay, so um, let f right define from. R into R might be any function and consider um, the family call it um, omega um, omega i right i in capital I to the family of all oops family of all open set on Rn right such that such that for every i in i f equals zero almost everywhere um on wi so put or set um say w to be a union of wi i and i then under the above conditions f equals zero almost everywhere on on omega and by definition, I mean, this is not the definition of the support. By definition, the support of F is the complement of omega in Rn. So um, some people actually call it the essential support, right? So don't get confused. I mean, yeah, so it's actually the same thing. Okay, um, before um, diving into the proof, let's have a couple of remarks. So a remark. So the first thing is that, call it A. I mean, assume, um, assume that F1 equal, equals F2, right, almost everywhere. On Rn, so F1 and F2 actually agree up to an all set. So clearly, I mean, clearly the support of or the essential support, if you want, support of um, of F1 equals support of F2. So consequently, um, you may talk. Let me talk about um, support of F, right? For FC in LP. So without, so we can talk about the support of the function F, right? Without, um, without actually um, saying which representative which representative we pick in the equivalence class representative to we pick in 
जी गुड सो दिस इज द फर्स्ट थिंग टू नोट सो द सेकंड वन इज दैट बी सो इफ द फंक्शन इज कंटिन्यूस इफ एफ इज कंटिन्यूस सो इफ एफ इज कंटिन्यूस ऑन आर एन इज ए कंटिन्यूस फंक्शन ऑन आर एन राइट इट इज कैन यू फॉर मीन इट इज इजी राइट इट इज सो लेट मी राइट इट Nope. Make this easy. It's easy to check that. I mean, easy to check that the new definition of the support, right, or the essential support, coincide with. Coincide with the usual definition. So, in fact, I mean, remember that I mean, when you have a continuous function, when f is continuous, um, I mean, almost everywhere in place. I mean. That um, property hold everywhere when the function is continuous. Okay, so let's go back to the proof of um, our proposition. So proposition of of proposition. I think it was four point seventeen. Okay. So let f right define from r into r, right? Be a function. And then you have w i i in capital i, the family of all open set of r n, family of all open set in r n, right? Such that For every i in i, um, f equals zero almost everywhere on omega i. Now um, observe that since since the set i, I mean, is not necessarily countable, so it need not be. Countable, right? It is not. I mean, it is not um, clear that f equals zero almost everywhere on on omega. So let me just almost everywhere on omega, which was defined to be. The union of omega i, i in i. I mean, if i was actually countable, then I mean we would have f equal zero almost everywhere on omega because I mean the countable union of null set is a null set. So, okay. However, um, we can still recover the countable case, right? Um, I mean, by proceeding as follow. So, um, I will first, I mean. Hide the result and then say why it holds. So, um, so let me probably um, let me just write everything down. So, however, we may um, recover the countable. Is as follows. So there exists 
tell you why in a second. So there is this. I mean, there is a countable um, family. You call it O n, right? N capital N, right? Of open set. Of open set um, in R n of course, right? Such that such that every open set in R n is the union. Or some points. So why is that? In fact, remember that um, or indeed you know that I mean the space R n is actually second countable second countable. What does that mean? It means that um, R n has um, a countable basis, which basically means that um, R n has um, countable collection, countable collection. Of open balls, right? Such that such that um, not every but such that any open set in the topology. Oops. The topology can be represented as the union of element from from this countable collection. Right, you can actually, for instance, um, you can consider open balls with. Um, um, I mean, you can consider. Um, consider open balls, right? Consider open balls with. with rational. Rational radius right centered at points with rational coordinate. So, such a family um, ON actually exists. And therefore, we can write, I mean, put, you write for every i, capital I, right? Um, Wi is what is the union of ON, right? Um, and belonging to, say, AI. And W is the union of ON, and belonging to B, right, with B. Being the union of the AI, I in I. So, however, um, for every I in I, we know that F equals zero almost. 
everywhere on omega i. So this means that for every n in B, f equals zero almost everywhere on O n, right? So this means that f equals zero almost everywhere on the union of O n, right? And in B, but this is exactly this is exactly omega. So you have and then you're done. Okay, so now let's state the property of the support of the convolution product of two functions. So proposition um, four point eighteen. No, probably I, I, I'm doing a mistake somewhere. Anyway, so let f um, be an element of L one of Rn, right, and G in LP of Rn. So let me just highlight this. So with P this time between um, 1 and infinity, right, included 1 and infinity, then the support of the convolution product is actually contained into, into the closure of the support of f plus support of g. Okay, good, so let's go to the proof. So, um, so fix x in Rn, right, such that such that the map which at y associate f of x minus y times g of y is integrable. Right, I mean, you can see theorem 4.15, I mean the very first theorem we proved in this lecture. I mean, prove that this was actually, this is just for your recall. Prove that this was actually integrable for almost every x. So we have um, so we have convolution product of f and g at x being equal to this integral. I mean, this is just. Um, By definition, so there is nothing like we just have any by definition, but this is again equals to the integral over over the support of the function f trans, um, evaluated at the translated point x minus I mean the variable intersected with the support of of g right of f of x minus y g of y, g y. But now, um, what you have to observe is that, I mean, this support here, okay, so this is exactly equal to x minus 
we support the first. So let's have a look at the proof, right? Um, let's write it here, indeed. So let y in rn, right? Such that f of x minus y is different from zero, right? Then um, y can be written as x minus x minus y, right? And this is actually an element of support of f. So we have already one inclusion. Now um, let's have a look at the reverse side. Right? So now let y in support of oops. Let y in the support of f, right? So this means that f of y is actually different from zero, right? So we have um, f of x minus x minus y um, is equal to f of y, which is actually different from zero. So x minus y is an element of the support of f of x minus minus dot. So we are basically done. Okay, good. So this support is equal to x minus support of f. Very good. good. Mm, let me just kind of try to keep it aside. Okay, good. Now, I mean, we proceed. Now we proceed by contraposition. So, if X is not in the support of F plus support of of G, right? Then we know that um, X minus support of F, right, intersected with support of of G is actually empty, and so the convolution product, right, as we seen above will be equal to zero. Thus, um, we get that this equals zero almost everywhere on what on support of F plus support of of G complement. So in particular, In particular, um, f convoluted with g, with g equals zero almost everywhere on the interior of what support of f plus support of of g complement, but the interior of this. So let me just like, good. Right, because you know that the interior of a set is actually contained into the set itself. So this means that no, it's just about um, using our, I mean, our knowledge of topology, right? So this means F, the convolution product is zero almost everywhere. You know that the interior of the complement is actually the complement of the closure. So this is almost zero almost everywhere on support of F plus support of G closure everything complemented. So this means that the support of 
f plus support of g right complemented is actually contained into the support of um, of the convolution product in the complement of the support of f times g of f um, convoluted with g so this means that um, i mean if you take i mean if you complement right we get that support of this is actually containing to support of f plus support of the closure and this is what we wanted to show okay good so remark So if both F and, and G right have um, compact support, we just highlight compact support, then the conversion product also has compact support. This is actually easy to see. So, however, um, convolution product, right, need not have compact support. If only one of them, I mean, either F or G has compact support. If only one of them um, has compact support. So, good, so, um, now let's um, have a look at the definition. Because so far we know how to define um, function in the LP space. So let omega be a subset of Rn, be, I mean, be open. And let p of course between one and infinity. So openness is important. So we say that a function f defined from omega to r. Um, belongs to belongs to I write it here down to LP lock of omega. So this is actually the space of p integrable function um, locally p integrable function. So it belongs to LP lock of omega if. F times chi k, right, is an element of LP of omega for every compact. For every compact set k containing two omega. Good. So um not that so this is so kind of a short remark so not that if 
you have the function f right that is um, locally p integrable right then the function is is in l1 lock of of omega you can actually check it so check it out okay so now you have um, an, an interesting property right which actually tell us something about the regularity of the conversion product when the function um, f is actually continuous with compact support so proposition 4.19 let f b means compact b um, in cc of rn be a continuous function with compact support on rn and g be a locally integrable function then the convolution product of f um, and g is well defined first of all is well defined um, I think we put here comma x is well defined for almost every x in rn and moreover moreover um, this convolution product is even the continuous map on rn okay proof so um not first that so not that for every x in rn like the function which at y associate um, f of x minus y times times d of y right is integrable for I mean it's, it's integrable on on rn right and therefore and therefore I mean this convolution product right is well defined for every x in, in for almost every x in i in fact so this is just a consequence of what we did so far of what we saw so far so indeed um the integral of r n of f of x minus y times d of y dy like this is um, nothing else than the being than being the integral over over k because remember um f is a continuous function with compact support so this is the integral over this dy right where um where the support of of f is actually contained to k right k is actually compact and therefore this is actually less or equal than because f is continuous so i can bound this term by the infinity norm of f times the integral of a k of d of y dy I can even put it up to the value here to be on the safe side and this is so just finite because 
JSON error one doc. Okay, so the conversion of log is already defined. So now let's prove the continuity part. So continuity. So for the continuity, we will prove um, sequential continuity. So let xn, right? The sequence that converge um, that converges to strongly to x, right? And let um, k, right, be a fixed compact set. In Rn such that x minus the support of f. I mean, we saw that this was again um, the support of f x minus dot, right? f evaluated at the translated point. So, so this is containing to k, right? For every n, let me just write it again. So, sorry, put n here. So that this is again um, support of f of x and minus dot. As I said, dot is just a placeholder for the for the variable. So therefore, therefore you have um, f of x and minus y. Equal zero for every n and for every y outside of k. So we did use so we did use um, from the uniform continuity. We did use from the uniform continuity of the function f. Because, I mean, um, we call that f is continuous, right? And the compact, right? So that implies f is uniformly continuous. So using the uniform continuity of the function f, right, we did use that. Um, we deduce that the absolute value of f of x n minus y minus f of x minus y in the absolute value this is less or equal than um, say epsilon n right times chi k of y this is the let me just write it properly the indicator function of the set k and this holds for every n of course and for every y in Rn. So with epsilon n going to zero, right, as n goes to plus infinity. So we conclude that, so we conclude that, I mean, if you multiply both sides, right, by um, absolute value of, of dy, so you conclude that the absolute value of the convolution product of f and g at xn, right, minus this convolution product evaluated at x this time is less or equal than epsilon n times the integral of a k of the absolute value of gy dy. But this term here actually goes to zero, of course, as n goes to plus infinity. And this is what, um, so this actually proves that the convolution product is, is continuous, right? Because remember, um, I mean, every metric space is actually first countable, right? So sequential continuity actually imply um, continuity. 
Okay, so um, rotation. So let's have some rotation. Oops. So um, let omega. Increase in R and B. B open. So um, we denote by CK omega. This is I mean the space of of um, k times continuously differentiable function, right? Space of function. K times continuously differentiable on on omega, right? Of course, k vector equal to one going to be an integer, right? So and then. Um, the infinity c of omega like this this is just the infinity of omega intersected with c c c of omega so right so this is often um, denoted by d omega like space of test function or c infinity zero of omega so this is i mean the space of functions that are infinitely continuously differentiable, like with compact support. And Z that's the infinity of omega is nothing less than this is just the intersection of the CK of omega, right? Okay, then. So If f, I mean, it's a C1 function, right? Its gradient is defined the gradient of, of f is defined by oops, napla of f equals Now, if f is in ck of omega, right, and you have a multi index alpha, say alpha 1, alpha 2, up to um, alpha n, right, is uh, it's a multi index. Of length, um, let's call it. This is the summation of the alpha i, i moving from 1 to to n of length less or equal than k. Then you write then you write um, the alpha derivative of of f to is equal to this expression dot 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 good so proposition I think it is proposition 4.20 I think so so if um, you have a function f right in ckc of rn I mean this proposition is a kind of um, 
generalization of the previous proposition, right, about the regularity of the convolution product. So if f is actually in CKC of of R and right, I mean k times continuously differentiable with compact support k greater equal than one, right? And then you have d, which is in n one log of R n, right? Then I mean again the convolution product is well defined and is even k times continuously differentiable. Then you have also this uh, property, the the alpha derivative of the convolution product is nothing else than I mean you shift the derivative to the function f, right, and then convoluted with with d. And this is of course for every multi-index alpha of length less than equal than k. So in particular, um, in particular, if the function is, I mean, if f is actually infinitely continuously differentiable, right? It's compact support on R n and g again is in L one log. Of R n, then the convolution product this is infinitely differentiable. Okay, the proof is actually. Um, The proof is not actually difficult, right? So we just write, we just kind of, um, I'm not going to the proof, right? I'll just tell you what to do. And well, you, I mean, you'll be the one to, I mean, to go through, through the proof. And of course, if you have any problem, feel free to, to leave your thought in the comment or reach out to me. So the proof is actually by induction, right? So proof is by induction. So, um, it is enough to. It's actually enough to consider only the case k equals equals one. So this is this I leave to you. So please try it out, right? And feel free to to reach out to me. Okay. So I think we will stop here for for me for this video so um thank you for watching and we see again each other in the next video